On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. I'm not the dumbest guy in the world, but I, I don't want to live like this anymore. What can I do? Where can I get an additional stream of income? Because the, the old logic is just work harder, just work harder. And I thought to myself, how, how I, I can't work any harder. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. Today, I've got Stuart Gethner here on the King stage. My brother, Stuart, how are you? Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Well, I appreciate you being here. The excitement is, is mutually founded. But uh, you've got some experience. You've got uh, uh, different industries. You get to touch a lot of industries now in your current business. So I'm excited for you to be here and share your wealth and knowledge. Tell us what kind of business you have now. Right now, I own a real estate investment company. We're a small boutique company located in Phoenix, Arizona. And we invest in small multifamily, up to 100 units. Mainly, we've been here in Arizona for the past 20 years. We've now started to expand outside Arizona into Cincinnati area and some parts of Florida. I love it. I love it. All the, uh, all the, well, I guess minus Cincinnati, I was going to say all the warm places, but yeah. Florida, Florida, Florida is good for real estate. I'm excited to be able to jump into some of this. I've got a background in some real estate. We've had some cool real estate guests on the show. You've got a little bit of a, of a background though, that's different than real estate. We'll get to that here in a second. Sure. What's your why? What's the burning deep desire before we get into the nitty gritty of the story? Who's Stuart? Why are you doing this? What's the bigger picture? So my immediate, more recent why is my, my kids. So I wanted to make sure that I was able to provide for my kids. They're now grown adults. I had, I had a son and two daughters, and my goal was to get them to college age, not on drugs and not pregnant or getting any, anybody <laughs> pregnant. As a, as a good checklist, it's check, 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 check. Yeah, and, and I was able to check the boxes, which is, I'm, I'm proud to say. But, but ultimately, when I was a kid growing up, I always wanted to be a major league baseball player. So I couldn't make it in the major leagues, but I used to watch this guy on television, a guy named Dave Delgado, a guy named Carl Sheets. And I watched these guys build these real estate cash flow empires. At nighttime, they would collect their rent checks. In the daytime, they'd be surfing in Hawaii. And I said, <laughs> you know, one day I'd like to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. <laughs> here we are, are you surfing today or, or is that Not tomorrow? I'm surfing in Hawaii. But I'm able to create passive cash flow. The, the red checks come in the first of the month. You know, a hundred percent of them don't always come in a hundred percent of the time. But for the most part, it, it, it's a pretty good gig. Yeah, I mean, we're recording here on May second, so rent, rent, rent's coming in as we speak. No question. No question. I've gotten notifications about our properties here in the last couple of days. Some people pay early, some people pay a little bit late, but it always comes around the first, as you mentioned. Yes. Love, love that part of it. Okay. So, so you got kids, you've got another leg, you got to like another layer, a legacy or, or something to leave behind. Yeah. What, uh, like, are they involved in the business? Like how, how are they connected? If, if anything to what you're doing there physically every single day. So again, with my, with, with my kids, I want to make sure that they knew how to make a living, how to make money, regardless of what relationships, regardless of their education level. So I would take them with me when they were little. And I would be putting banded signs in the ground. I'd take them to clean out properties. I would take them. I would take them. They're not in the business, but I can honestly say they're all independent. They're all doing well. And one owns a couple of UPS stores in the Valley. The other is a national sales manager out of Chicago. That's and my youngest one does professional rodeo. So they all oh, okay. do different things. But yeah. in my eyes, they're success. And I'm extremely proud of them. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think it's a good distinction. It doesn't mean that the kids have to be in the business. I love what you said, though, is that you you took them so that they would learn, right? So that yeah. they would learn how to do deals or learn what properties yes. are or the value yes. of assets, all these things. Yes. And now they have their own their own road to go. So I think as kings, this is a question. I've got young kids. So this is a question that I often like to ask, especially 
folks that, that have gone through the deal with kids. How, when, what'd you do? You know, all those fun things that, that we'd like to know. So let's get to your story. You, you had a previous life before real estate or, or maybe as you were building your real estate. Talk about that. Talk about how we came to the moment we are now. So as I mentioned, couldn't make it in Major League Baseball. And my dad was a pharmacist. My grandpa was a pharmacist. My uncle Max was a pharmacist. So with nothing else to, left to do, I went to pharmacy school in St. Louis, graduated, moved out to Arizona, could not stand the, the cold weather back in the Midwest. That's and right. so landed here in the Phoenix area and started working as a pharmacist. One of the challenges that I had was, and I think this is true with everyone, no matter how much money you make, if you have, if you have a credit card that gives you a five or $10,000 credit limit, you tend to spend that as well. So mm-hmm. if you make 50,000 a year and you got a $10,000 credit card limit, you spend 60. If you have a hundred, you spend 110, 200, 210, whatever, whatever that is. And that's kind of where I was. I was in, I had up to my ears in credit card debt and had these two little girls at the time. And we, we used to go to this thing called the Renaissance Festival. Yeah. And it's out here in the middle of the desert and they dress in joust and they dress in medieval times. And my little girls like to go and get those henna tattoos. Oh, sure. So I knew I was up to my eyeballs and credit card debt, specifically my Discover card. So I went to the grocery store here at Fry's, which is a Kroger, to buy the discounted tickets because they didn't want to pay full price at the door. Right. And I remember taking my kids to the, to the Renaissance Festival until they got those big turkey legs that you try to bite and all kinds of horses and gear and kings and queens and all kinds of stuff. And we had a great day. They did the henna tattoos and we're on our way back and I'm on the highway. And I noticed that my, my gas light yellow starts to flicker a little bit. And I look down at my dashboard and I'm running low on gas. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I can probably make it home. We're about 45, maybe 55 minutes away. And my, I'm looking in the back seat. My kids are sleeping because we're on the highway. They're crashing their car seats. And we get on, we, we, we change exits to get another highway. And this flashing light turns solid yellow. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I, I know what this is. I'm running low on gas. Let's get off of the next exit and, and fill up. So I get off of the next exit and I take out my Discover card knowing that I'm at my credit limit. And I put it in the little machine and I pull it out. And I'm thinking to myself, as I look, my kids are still asleep. I remember my, I have my gym bag in the back seat, And I think I have a couple of dollars in that just in case my credit card gets declined. And I look over to the machine and Bing, it says approved. You can lift the lever. And I was like, oh, ain't God discovered. So I put the, I put the nozzle in the gas tank. I fill it up all the way and, and it shuts down. I say, I, I know I'm at my limit. I, I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to fill up again. Let me just top this off. So I start squeezing the nozzle to top it off and bam, gas just backfires and spills all over. And I, I like the smell of gas, but I don't like it when I'm covered in it kind of head to toe. So I put back the nozzle and I remember thinking to myself, man, there's got to be a better way. I, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm not the dumbest guy in the world, but I, I don't want to live like this anymore. What can I do? Where can I get an additional stream of income? Because the, the old logic is just work harder, just work harder. And I thought to myself, how, how I, I can't work any harder. I stand on my feet as a pharmacist, filling prescriptions, trying to help people. What can I do? And I remembered as a kid, I wanted to be doing this real estate investing. So I started to educate myself. I hired myself a coach, a mentor to teach me to cut out the timeline of what I was going to be able to do. And I was so thankful that the coach was allowing me to make payments to him because I really didn't have the, the, it was $4,000 at the time, to be very honest with you. And it was probably the best money I've ever spent. So with that, I was able to start doing, I've done some wholesaling, did some fix and flips done some buy and holds and be able to create not just immediate cash flow, but I've learned how to create long-term cash flow as well. And for me, that's where you create wealth, long-term cash flow, passive income. Yeah, I love it. And and not only are you doing that for yourself, but you also help others do the same now, right? That's right. So for 15 years, I taught at our local RIA, our real estate education, real estate investment advisory. I also have 15 online classes for the national RIA. I was very fortunate that Forbes real estate put me on the real estate council. Yeah. So my, that's a passion of mine is trying to help others to show them how to create this. You know, it's, yeah. I, I always say that the concepts stay the same. When I was a kid growing up, I used to watch this cartoon called the Flintstones. 
Don't yeah. ever heard of him, right? And, and Fred Flintstone used to work down at the rock quarry. And, and, and he, he had a, his boss was Mr. Slate. And Mr. Slate used to say when he would get frustrated with Fred, he would say, good help is hard to find. And so I would always joke, good help is hard to find in the bedrock era. Good help is hard to find today. Concepts stay the same, but the times change. So for us who do real estate investing, maybe the color of the cabin has changed. Maybe the countertops, the flooring changes, but the concepts, yeah. they stay the same. Yeah. What are those concepts, Stuart? What, what, what stays the same in real estate that someone who has never done real estate before getting started today could, could guarantee themselves or, or would be able to count on? Absolutely. So, so that's a great question, by the way. So off, off, the, off the top and in the beginning of any business, real estate or any retail business, you make your money when you buy. I cannot control, you know, the joke is my crystal ball broke, right? I don't have it anymore. I can't <laughs> predict the future. Right. But what I can know is, is if I buy right and market goes down a little or goes down a little bit more, I'm still going to be okay. You yeah. don't bet on the come. You don't bet at the today's prices, paying today's prices, hoping, hoping, hoping that that's a bad idea. So the first concept is you make your money when you buy. Yeah. Love that. Love that. And, and I loved how you also said that, that that's applicable for businesses as well. It, it doesn't, you know, if you're going to buy a business or, or really, I guess anything. Right. So uh, but, example, but specifically real estate. Yeah, but, but any business. So when, when, when I was in pharmacy, one thing that I learned was, is that the consumer is not stupid, right? So if you're selling your Tylenol or your aspirin for $5 a bottle and Walmart is selling it for 4 or $3 a bottle, she's going to go to Walmart where she can buy it for less. The consumer's not stupid. So if you want to be competitive, you have to buy better in order to be competitive in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. great, like you're saying, a, a great concept to realize across, across industry. I think that's super applicable. Okay, so <clears throat> inside the weeds of you starting to put together cash flow, this is not something that just, you know, hey, I decided today to become a real estate investor and now I'm wealthy. Like this, this takes a little bit of building. It takes a little bit of time, right? Would you agree? Yeah, it's, it's not get rich quick, okay? So that's a great comment, Jazz. But I'll tell you what, it's get rich slow. Works every time. If you have a plan and you're methodical about your plan and you go step by step, it, 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 it's not rocket science. It's something that yeah. you not only can you do once, but you can scale. Once you learn the basic fundamentals, and, and when I work with my clients, I, especially those that are beginners, I find the biggest challenge that they have is pulling the trigger, the yeah. fear. It, and what ends up happening is they find a deal, we evaluate the deal, we walk the property, whatever that is, they can't pull the trigger for, for whatever reason, right? And yep. someone else does. Yep. And then they look back at that and go, I knew it. I knew it. And so that's what they need to give them the confidence that they have the wherewithal to be able to pull the trigger on the next opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that lost opportunity can, can give us some confidence or... You know, for some, it's a it's a swift kick in the in the hiney or or the front side, maybe. <laughs> but you realize you're like, oh, bummer, and then that takes you into action, or or it takes you into a downward spiral, which obviously wouldn't be a great case. Okay, so it's a so not get rich quick, but a get rich for sure is what I'm hearing you say. Yes, which I love that. I love I love to get rich for sure. Um, been doing real estate for for a while now, and I like real estate deals. I like analyzing deals. I've held back on not pulling on a trigger. I've done a deal that didn't make me money. I've done deals that made it. So like there's there's a mix, right? Like there's all kinds of stuff that happens, especially in real estate, because you can be so creative. Like we could do this, like you said, a little bit of wholesaling, a little bit of fix and flip, a little bit of hold, a little bit of multifamily. Yeah. Obviously you've got a little bit more of a, of a of a focus now, but through your journey, you said, I'm working my plan. I want to know what was a good decision that you made inside of that plan that we could replicate in a business or in our real estate investing, if we're listening. So for me, and this is just for me, having someone, so, so, so you're only as good as your team and, and you can't go at it alone. And, and by the way, I tried going at it alone. And what I learned was that there are people out there that actually want to help you. And, yeah. and it reminds me of a story of my mom. My mom was 99 and, and she's probably not going to listen to this podcast. So this is a good <laughs> story to tell. My cousin, Judy, always likes to make meatloaf and bring it to my mom. Okay. And so she's coming one day to bring meatloaf to my mom. And my mom says to me, you know, I really don't like her meatloaf. Maybe I should call her and tell her not to bring it. And I said, mom, 
you know, this is something she enjoys doing. This makes her feel important, her contribution. Don't yeah. take that away from her. Yeah. And so that's the same with people in our lives today. When we want to get started in something, there are people, professionals who have done this already, who, will, who are willing to help and assist. And so trying to go at it alone is really hard, especially when you're new or when you're trying to scale, even when you're established. It's, you're only as good as your professional network. And being, being able to pick up the phone and call someone for information, because even though I've been doing this for a while, Chaz, I don't know it all. And by the way, when you know it all, things change anyway, right? The market changes, the banks, the Fed, all the inflation, unemployment, all this stuff that we cannot control. But what we can control is our strategy and our network. So for me, like goes on when I found someone and was able to pay them to help mentor me and get me through the weeds. You, you know, they say you never get hit by the bus you see coming. And when you're first starting out, even when you're established, there are buses you don't see coming. So getting right. that assistance, getting that wisdom, that knowledge, that mentorship has tremendous value. Yeah. I loved how you you gave a distinction, whether you realize it or not, of reaching out because uh, a paid scenario or a free scenario. They're listening to you right now with no cost, nope. uh, but you need both is the point. You can't, in my opinion, you can't just, or let, let me say it like this. I freeloaded for a long time and it wasn't because I didn't have the money. It was because I was watching YouTube and listening to podcasts and I was listening to books and I was doing all the free stuff, which is great. At some point, though, when you put your money where your mouth is or where your desires are, would you agree that things tend to change a little bit more rapidly? No question. Well, you're, we, 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 now you're financially vested, right? right. Now you've come out of pocket. And, yeah. and you're right, Jess. You can go on YouTube University and pretty much learn anything you want to learn. But I think what makes our services unique is that I hold your hand. I work with you shoulder by shoulder. It's Good. not some... Uh, books and tapes that you got to listen to and then a manual right. that a company go do it yourself. Notes. Yeah. You get me. So, uh, I, and, and I like to create success stories. So yeah, even though people think I'm a nice guy, I'm a good guy. If we don't create a success story for you, we failed and I don't want to fail. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I think that's a good distinction as well between the paid and free is that you've got that next level of implementation or handholding or do it with you or having someone in your pocket. You know, even guys that I've thought about where I've met, you know, one time, two times, and I paid this sometimes scenarios where they didn't even ask for money and I sent them a check, you know, <laughs> because I wanted to be number one appreciative, but also then I wanted to hold myself like I paid that dude $3,000 for that lunch. You better take those notes and put them into good use, right? And so, anyway, regardless of all that, I think what you're saying for the listener, if they're paying attention, that they need to build a network, the things that they can control, which include listening going to conferences, I'm sure, but then also hiring a mentor coach. Anything you want to add there? Yeah, and, and not being afraid to make mistakes. And so, you know, Warren Buffett would say, rule number one is don't lose money. Rule number two, see rule number one. And yep. so, and, 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 and you, were, you were very honest and straightforward, Chaz, when you said, not all your deals are home runs. And so not all my deals are home runs, you know, and, and not all my deals are perfect. However, the role of a good leader is to be able to make decisions. And sometimes when leaders make the wrong decisions and they realize it's the wrong decision, that's why they're leaders. They can twist it and turn it to make it the right decision. Yeah. So sometimes people think like not making a decision at all is making a decision, and it's not. Great leaders make decisions. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, obviously, <clears throat> I believe where we are today is based on the decisions that we've made. I mean, that's it's a, a large reason why I bring up a good and bad decision. So I want to flip the coin here on you and talk about something that maybe hasn't gone super well, or maybe it's something that you've learned. Uh, of course, we we know how to turn our failures into wins, like you just said. Every good leader does. But what's one of those failures for you? Give us some, give us some detail. Uh, well, I, I thought during the pandemic it might be a good idea to look at some more commercial property, as even though we, we weren't out able to go out and visit retail when things were going, when things were really tight, yeah. you still needed to go see a dentist if you wanted to get your teeth cleaned. You still wanted to go to the chiropractor to get your neck adjusted. There are still places that you had to do in person. And as I looked to doing, buying a medical building and being, being a pharmacist, I thought, well, you know, I can talk the talk and walk the walk with these guys. One of the things I learned was it's a different beast than doing multifamily. So I've done some commercial deals, 
But one of the struggles I had was buying a medical building where everybody's leases were staggered and we had one big, there was going to be one big tenant and there was uncertainty whether that tenant was going to renew their lease or not. So here I am thinking I know what I'm doing and walking the walk and talking the talk and all that stuff. And at the end of the day, I'm like, I really don't know what I'm doing here. And I should probably bow out before I, before I lose more money. You know, we had put earnest money down. The money went hard. I had an inspection and I realized, I think I'm in a little bit over my head. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so the failure, the loss there is that you lost some money. Um, you lost probably a little bit of like clout, a little bit of ego, like a little, little ego hit. <laughs> <laughs> some investors may have thought, well, man, I thought we were doing this deal, but now we're not. So maybe there was some confusion or maybe a little bit of like uncertainty about where you were taking things. But I want for the listener to pay attention to what everything you just said. Even though all those things were happening, you had the honesty to look inside the mirror, really inside yourself and go, okay, I either, I either stop now and hit all of those things that I just said, or potentially down the road, I take all of those things at a hundred X level when this thing goes south and I, I make a deal really, really bad. Is that kind of what you were thinking? No question. So, you, and you know, we, and I, and I think for the listeners, we all make mistakes, right? We, we all try to go outside our box and, and, and if you're not going, if you're not uncomfortable with what you're doing, then you're not growing. And so I, I learned from that experience that if I, if I had pulled that trigger, I, I probably could have figured out a way to make things right. But my challenge was that big tenant and I didn't know how to solve that problem. And I knew that I didn't know how to solve that problem. I did have the relationships and that would have been a terrible cash flow tragedy had, had they decided not to renew their lease and they move out and I'm stuck holding the bill for the mortgage coming out of pocket. So you hit those right on the head. How do, how do entrepreneurs today, maybe some that are listening right now, how do they take this dynamic of on one side being uncomfortable? You just said, in order to grow, I have to put myself in situations that I'm uncomfortable. But then on the other side of that coin is like, I need to stay in my lane and I need to do what I'm comfortable with so that I can win. <laughs> How do we play that back and forth? Like it's like, it's like a line we're teetering. That's great. You know, it, and it reminds me of the example of you want to hire someone with experience right. and the person has no experience, but how does that person get experience unless you give them the opportunity? Right. So that's, that's the ultimate dilemma, right? It's, it's not a problem that we can easily solve. In my opinion, the answer is partnerships, joint ventures, strategic alliances. Yeah. I did a fix and flip many years ago and we made $180,000 on the fix and flip. I had a business partner. She took 90, I took 90. I paid off some debt. I went ahead and invested some other property. I think I went on a vacation. At some point in time, that 90,000 was gone. Maybe taking me a month, six months, a year, whatever that is, it was gone. And so no, I didn't have the money, but I wanted to stay in the game. So I still found deals. I still found opportunities, but I didn't have the money. So now I have to find a partner, someone to joint venture with that does have the money, that sees the vision, that I can work with and they'll invest in not just the project, but they'll invest in me. So finding others to work with on your, as a teammate, it could be permanent, it could be temporary, but it's a great way not just to get started, but it's absolutely what you need to scale because everybody comes to the table bringing something. And, and at some point in time, I'm going to need other resources. I'll give you one more example. I, I own some property with a gentleman named Art Scott and a girl named Tamara Peterson. We own property together. Art is a general contractor. Tamara is a bookkeeper. I own a property management company. <clears throat> when the tenants call and the water is leaking out of the faucet or the air conditioning is not working or whatever the problem is, I call Art. Art doesn't go there a week from Thursday because he's busy. Art goes there on his way home because that's his investment as well, right? And every month we get monthly reports on our properties from Tamara. We meet quarterly. We do quarterly distributions. That's what Tamara does. Yeah. So I've been able to leverage my skill sets, not being a contractor, not, not, not being a bookkeeper, by having a partnership, a joint venture with others. Yeah. And we've been in this joint venture for over 10 years. Yeah. So that's what I would say to your listeners. Starting or wanting to scale, it's hard to do it alone. And being able to establish some professional network, some outside relationships, and others are willing to help. Art's yeah. willing to help. Tamara's willing to help. 
And so that's, in my opinion, how you really can get started and scale. Yeah, I love, I love that answer more than I can say other than, gosh, darn it, I love that answer. But here's my follow-up. Stuart, what I have found in real estate, this is a normal thing. You, you got an operator, you have an investor, you have a contractor, or you have a, you know, the, a mix of, of, of partners. I'm in several of these, as, as just as you described. But in the business world, outside of real estate, it's like, ooh, you know, stay away from partners. They don't work. You know, do it alone. Like, why do you think that that is, number one? And number two, how do, how do we transcend that? How does, how does a business owner today who's not in real estate take what you just said? Because you didn't say anything about real estate. You right. said, this guy has this seat, and That's this right. guy has this seat, and this gal has this seat, and together we operate the business. <laughs> That's right. Right? Right. So, so here's my thought on that, right? And, and, and that is, my experience has been, and when I go to the different RIAs and I see people sitting together and talking, and they like, oh, you want to do fix and flips? Yeah, let's go grab a cup of coffee together, and, and let's talk about it. And, and they go off for, they go to Denny's, they go to McDonald's, they have a cup of coffee and they laugh at each other's jokes and everything seems wonderful. And they say, let's go into business together. Right. And when you go into business with someone, honestly, it's like being married. Yep. Right. So you wouldn't marry someone just by going for a cup of coffee at a Denny's or McDonald's. Right. And so I, I taught a program on establishing partnerships and joint ventures and strategic alliances. And one of the pillars is, is that we have to establish the foundation of our business to make sure not just that we're a good fit, but also define some of the roles. And I, my, my experience has been that when people go into these partnerships that you speak of that fail, right, they haven't done enough due diligence, not just on the other person, but on their own relationship, their own escort, their own LLC, who yeah. d- the defined roles, who's going to do the books, who's going to do the marketing, who's going to do this, that, or the other, and being able to, you know, you know, we use the expression, I don't want you playing in my sandbox. So if I'm responsible for these tasks, right, I'll share them with you, but this is my domain. So Mike, and let me add this. Well, when I was with the, the Arizona Real Estate Investor Association, we, we would offer for free the opportunity to look at your business plan. No charge, look at your business plan. And my job, our job was to poke holes in it. In the hundreds or maybe thousands of business plans that I've looked at, not one of them, not one of them said, I'm going to get divorced at the end and I'm going to go to severe depression and lose <laughs> my business, right? Yeah. Not one of them ended with, my business partner is going to drain the bank account and I'm going to have to go bankrupt. That's right. They all have happy endings. Every single one of them, correct? Right? That's right. And so for our, our responsibility as entrepreneurs is, and I said this before, nothing ever happens according to plan, but you wouldn't know it if you didn't have a plan. So we yeah. have to start with the plan and we have to be flexible with it. But at the end of the day, just like marriages, they don't always work out. But I found if you do your due diligence up front and establish rules and, of, of the relationship up front, those relationships last a lot longer than just getting together over a cup of coffee at Denny's or McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. You gave a lot there. I, I want the listener just to hit the pause button, rewind. <laughs> And listen to that again. No, no wonder that you've taught classes on this. The biggest thing that I can like agree with is that it's a marriage. And so, okay, fine. Like, I mean, I, I don't know the last time someone dated, like you said, for a cup of coffee or even a week or a month. Yes, we all know those fairy tales happen, but not really. Really, it's a it's an intentional effort to get to know each other and to make sure that there's alignment, like real alignment, just like in a marriage. Like, I'm not planning on getting divorced to my wife. Well, and then on top of that, there's like a commitment. Like I, I am not getting divorced to my wife, right? So if I, if I enter in a business relationship in the same way, obviously there needs to be a plan on how to exit if something were to happen. Because in a business you can exit, but th- it can't just be roses, you know, just because we're 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 buddies is what is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, that no no question. And all relationship businesses, marriages, friendships, they all go in cycles. They all have their highs. They all have their lows. And just like you said, the commitment, when I do partnerships with, and I do joint ventures, one of the things that I say flat out is let's agree to leave our egos at the door and let's do what's best for the business. I don't have to be right. We don't have to take my idea. I just want the business to be successful. So I find sometimes that egos get in the way and let, let's agree, you and I, that we'll leave our egos at the door 
and look out for the business's best interest. Yeah, love that. That's a, those are great guiding principles. What to, what do you use now as far as guiding principles? What do you use now to make good decisions? Obviously, we talked good and bad here. Mm-hmm. Something comes across your desk today. Well, how do you analyze it? That's a great question. And let me tell you what I learned. And I've been doing this for a little while. For the first lesson I learned is no knee-jerk reactions. Good. Okay? So if something comes across my desk, if it's a real estate deal and I need to do it down and dirty and evaluate it right away, I'll evaluate it right away. But at the end of the day, I, I use this expression, and I'm sure you've heard of it. Let me sleep on it. Yeah. Let me sleep on it. And I find that if I give myself a little time to digest it and give my subconscious mind a, a, an opportunity to let it sink in, that I'll come up with questions, solutions, other thoughts, other ways to look at the same thing that I may not have thought of at that moment. So for me, giving myself a little bit element of time, I have found has really helped me navigate through the woods and come out on the right side. Yeah. I love that answer. Being a, a decisive and quick action taker myself, I've had to learn how to <clears throat> add a little bit of time, but that doesn't necessarily mean weeks or months or procrastination. What I'm hearing you say is poise. And, and I've, I've brought this out in a couple, couple of other listeners or other guests. What would you say though, to the listener right now, who's going, ah, but like, if I wait, then I'm going to delay. Or if I wait, then I end up procrastinating. I ended up not doing it. Or I, it's always a like, boom, just make the decision and roll. That's kind of how they operate now. What would you say? Yeah. So, so, and, and I tell this to my clients all the time. When they call me, I'll tell them to trust your gut. Trust your gut. At the end of the day, there's the pit of your stomach. You got, you, you kind of got a feeling and I would trust that feeling. And if the opportunity slips by, there's always going to be another opportunity. Whether you're a flipper, a business owner looking to buy some merchandise, whatever that is, there's going to be another salesperson coming into your business. There's going to be another opportunity. This isn't the know-all be-all. No matter how important or big it seems at the time, there's always got to be the next opportunity. There's always going to be the next deal. Yep. Understood. Understood. Sometimes it's we have to fight off the FOMO in that moment of missing the deal or missing yeah. the opportunity. But yes. when you've been in the game long enough, you understand that the opportunity train comes pretty regularly. And it's just it's not a matter of necessarily missing it. It's a matter of do I align with this one? Does it help me get what I want? All the things that you kind of just mentioned. And then taking a little bit of time, have a little bit of poise to the scenario. Don't, don't rush something. I, I talked about this. Actually, I'd love to know your thoughts on this because we're kind of in the same vein here. I had a podcast guest a couple months ago and we were talking about, you know, this, this rush and hurry word and how that's different than speed or fast, right? And so you know, if, if I'm rushing to make the decision, then I'm hearing you say there's confusion and maybe I don't give my subconscious a chance to really process and get all the things out that maybe it does. But if I can give, give myself a little bit of, you know, pause or poise, it gets rid of the, like the rush and the angst, but then it, it actually allows me to go faster. Can you, can you give us some thoughts on that? Yeah. That's a great analogy to bring up to us business owners, entrepreneurs, or any person out there. And what I've learned excuse me, from my experience, is there's a difference between taking a risk and taking a chance. Okay? Mm, taking so a good. chance is when we go to Vegas and we bet it all on red. That's taking a chance. Risks, we can hedge our risks. We can educate ourselves. We can go to others to look at the same thing and ask for advice or wisdom. Yep. Whatever it is that we're doing, there's probably precedent. It's been done before. Going back to YouTube University or searching the internet for right. some type of historical perspective is always helpful. So yeah. you're right. Taking a chance and, and just, you know, just throwing it money into the wind versus hedging your risks. I'd rather take, and there are risks in any business, there are yeah. risks, but yeah. we can hedge our risks. We can take calculated risks and That's those right. I'd rather do more than chances. Yeah. I love that. So that, that there's a slight change of word there. Mm-hmm. Words are powerful. And I think that you hit it right on the nail there. What do you think about, mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question about KPIs, metrics. What would you think the one metric that you would track inside of your real estate investing world, if you could only pick one, what would that one be that you would track forever and ever? How many offers they have to write in order to get a deal? Mm. Why, why is that the one that you'd pick? Hey, kings and queens, Chaz Wolf. I want to talk to you about something that's super important to me. We put a lot of time and effort, we meaning myself and my team, into this podcast, into the content that goes out every single day. 
And if you have been getting any sort of value or insight from this, we want it to be able to reach other business owners too. So we would love if you would like, comment, share, leave a review, post, share again, <laughs> all of the things on social media, on all the different platforms, or even on the podcast mediums of Apple and Spotify. We would love to be able to get our content into more hands, more entrepreneurs, so they can grow their business as quick as possible. Together, we are building a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who are committed to growing their businesses to new heights. So let's do this. Let's help each other. Let's help each other grow. Because that's the one that leads to the most money. We metric, we do KPIs and everything. How many phone calls until we get an opportunity? How many, how many offers do we have? How many business do we have to make? How, how, on our direct mail, on our marketing, what makes the phone ring? But ultimately for us in real estate, at the end of the day, is getting an offer accepted. Doesn't matter whether we're wholesaling, flipping, or buying and holding. Nothing happens until we write an offer and the offer is accepted. So for us, tracking the offers, and I'll tell you this, to go one step further, our KPIs, are we got to write about 12 to 15 offers in order for, to, for one to get accepted. So I had about, when we first started, I had about 40 or so offers that were rejected sitting on my desk. And I, and this was quite a few years ago when everything was done in paper. Now it's all digital. They were literally sure. sitting on my desk and I didn't know what to do with them. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm like, well, do I shred them? Like, what do I do with them? And the, my lovely bride is a realtor, Stephanie. And I said to her, can you do me a favor? Can you just look at these 40 or so offers and just see if they were accepted, if they sold, if they didn't sell? I'm just kind of curious as to what happened with them. Yeah. And she had some downtime and she said, sure. So she went through, there's like I said, 40 or some offers. Two of those offers sold for less than what we offered. Two of those offers sold, one was for 500 above what we offered, and another one was for 1500 above oh. what we offered. Yeah. And so I, I looked at that pile not knowing what to do with it. I now know what to do with it. We recycle those and we stay in touch with those sellers every 30 or 45 days. And so our close rate, our KPIs are higher in the follow through with the offers that weren't accepted than right. our original 12 to 15 written offers to get one deal. Right. So tracking your and knowing your numbers is important. It, 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 it's a guiding light, but, but here's, here's the challenge. So, so for us, we need about 30 to 40 phone calls to get a deal. That's what we need. That's what it is. And we think we're pretty good. And we'll get those phone calls. Quit sending me this stuff. I'm never going to sell. I'm dying in this place. We get those yep. as well. That counts as a call. So I hired an intern, a guy named Kyle, who's not one of my clients. And I'm sure he'll listen to the podcast. True story. And he knew it was 30 to 40 phone calls. And he was in charge of answering the phone. So okay. 30 phone calls come in, no deal. 40 phone calls come in, no deal. 50 phone calls come in, no deal. Okay. He usually just walked around the office, happy to be here. After 60 phone calls, no deal. He's walking around the office sulking, thinking, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I think he's full of crap. Right. Phone call number 66 was a deal. Uh -huh. Phone call number 67 was a deal. And so even though the KPI say 30 to 40, yep. when we hit 30 to 40, it doesn't mean that that's, you know, it's, it's an aggregate. Yeah, that's right. And so when you look at your numbers, you have to, it's one thing to have the numbers, it's another thing to understand that. That's and right. so- and like I said, Kyle's a client today. He's killing it. He's got he's got a, a business in Southern California, a business in Seattle. And I, and I tell that story and he smiles and laughs and he says, you're right. You never know when the next one's going to come. It's just a numbers thing, but you can't get discouraged. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's important to know what the numbers are so you can measure. And also, I think this is good for the reverse too, because Kyle in that example was the person running the number or, or doing the, the action. And so the, the entrepreneur listening right now may not be the guy making the phone call or whatever the action is inside of their business. But here's what we do sometimes as entrepreneurs is that we don't understand the number either. We understand that at 30 to 40, like Kyle did, when our new guy has made, you know, 60 or 100 phone calls, uh -huh. we're going to immediately like, nope, sh out in with the new. And, and then they, they, they need to be replaced. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not necessarily saying give people chances longer than they need. What I am saying, though, is that. Sometimes the numbers work like what you're saying in a, just a, in a, in a different format. Maybe it's training. Maybe it's a different thing that's causing the, right. the number to, to not show up. It could just be that bang, bang, double deals back to back on 66 and 67. And then you look back and you're like, oh yeah, well, 32 and a half calls per deal. Wow. Would you right. look at that? Right. 
You're, you're spot it. on. So it's it's one thing to have the numbers, it's nothing to understand them. And that's one of the things that I do with my clients, and I'm very, very strict about it, is every quarter we go over numbers. We do quarterly meetings and we we, we take a look at, and so if you just started with me, then we don't, we, we're going to make some projections for the next quarter. Right. And then when that quarter ends, we're going to, just like you were driving a car, you're going to look in the rear view mirror just for a little bit, see what were those projections? How did we do? What does it look yep. like? And right. then at the, after that, we're going to start making projections going forward. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time is looking in the front window windshield. But we got to have some kind of metrics in order for us to know that we're on the right track. Yeah, I love that. What would you say is a good book or maybe just a resource for a business owner trying to grow their business or maybe who's interested in real estate investing? Yeah, so I like a couple of books. Well, one is The Illusions of a Reluctant Messiah. I think mm-hmm. it's a great book written by Richard Bach. He wrote Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And I think that's a great mindset. I think one of the biggest challenges we have as as humans, whether you're entrepreneurs or whatever whatever field you may be in, is mindset. I yeah. think to have a mm-hmm. mind shift and being able to work on your attitude. So I, to me, that that's a very important book as far as being creating a success, getting inside your own head and yeah. being, able to, being able to create more success and scalability. Love that. Love that. What do you think about networking or masterminding with other entrepreneurs or real estate investors? I think that they're good. And I'll give this piece of advice. When I go to, when I join one of those groups, I want to be the dumbest guy in the room. Yeah, I love that. And so I find that when you go to B&I or you go to some of those networking groups, that they're all there to sell you their stuff. And it's the insurance yeah. guy who is the realtor. There's the this, there's the that. And yep. they have their own agenda. That's right. And so if I'm going to be joining the mastermind, I want to make sure that I, I, I want to contribute. It's all about of course. You know those things. Those are contributions. But That's I right. want to make sure that those people understand what I'm trying to accomplish and the scale that I'm at. That's and right. so that I can be able to get, get, get opportunity and get knowledge and get insight, get wisdom, different perspectives, what I'm yeah. done for the day. Yeah. I love that. I love, I mean, in essence, for me, what you just did is it gave a, a, a description or an analogy of, of networking versus masterminding. One of my very first clients inside of Gathering the Kings Mastermind, we had our first event. This was a year or more ago, but after the event, he was like, you know, it was the first time I've met with people in, in a room that didn't want my business. Like they weren't soliciting me (laughs) and it was like an incredible feeling. Now, I I think most of us at this point have, have felt that at some point or another, but the reality of what you're saying is you got to get into a room that's number one, genuine, but number two, some big enough thinkers and big enough doers that can, can, can see what you're trying to do and then push you to that thing that you're trying to do. Would you agree? No, you're spot up. And and there's, there's a plethora of them out there. They're, they're all over the place. So you go yep. to meet up, you go into your church, you go into where, wherever you socialize, and there's always opportunities. I think our most valuable asset is our time. And so we need to be very judicious about our time and, be, you know, and, and pick the one that we think can serve us best. And, and know this, the, the, the mastermind groups that I've been in, even though many have been many very successful, they just don't last forever. Sometimes they last yep. about two or three years and then it's just time for a change, and that's okay. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah. You you do life with pe- people that continue to push you forward. So I would say, for me at least, that's that's what's changed always in the past for me. Is if I've if I've run the course, if I if there's no one in this circle that's pushing me, then then now we're just friends, which is totally fine. And I'm all about friendships. I'm even okay with paying for friendships. But if I'm there to push my business forward, and that's not happening, that's the the key indicator for me. So I'm hearing you say the same thing. Same thing. Um, yes, what, would you, what would you say about, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the kids earlier and bringing them into the business. My, my question for you about family is there's this work-life balance that I think is just bogus. What I like to say is work-life obsession, right? So what we've done in our business has been obsessed. We're, we're obsessed with deals, right? Like I know how many calls, I don't know how many deals we got to make offers on. Like you're obsessed. Same thing happens for our family. If we're not obsessed with our family, then we're not successful. So how have you done both over these years with, with, kids and businesses and investments, all this stuff. Have you done it all? Yeah. So I've done a terrible job. So in the beginning, when I owned pharmacies and, and worked as a pharmacist and started in real estate, I used the rationale, oh, I, I'm working this hard to provide for my family. Yep. It's We've okay all said if it. I miss, if I miss this, it's That's okay right. if I don't go to this wedding. It's okay if I don't fly back to Chicago 
they'll understand because I'm working. Right. And as time has gone on, I, I have missed those opportunities. And now I kind of go to the other extreme is I, I want to attend. And so when someone has a retirement party, a birthday party, whether it's for an infant, a two-year-old, or an 80-year-old, I'm uh, there. I, I want to attend. And so you're spot on. We, we try to create the balance. At the end of the day, we're kind of married to our business. It's our lifeblood. You know, yep. Brian Tracy, the business philosopher, once said, when you start your own business, he would say, you get to work half days. And then he'd yep. pause. And he'd say, but the good news is you get to pick which 12-hour shift you want. Yeah. <laughs> I love well, it. Yeah, and I love true, that. Right? And that's true. It's 100% true. Because I leave the office doesn't mean I'm done for the day. I yeah. might take something home with me. When, when I did pharmacy, I would look at our inventory sheets over dinner. So yeah. that's the commitment we make to be successful. Anybody right. could work 40 hours a week, right? Jim Rohn would say, if you whistle while you work, McDonald's will give you 25 cents an hour more as opposed to if you don't whistle while you work. So anybody right. could do the 40 hour thing. It's, it's being able to come early and stay late and making those relationships while at the same time making the same commitment to your family. And I got to be honest, it, it's not easy. In fact, it's, it, it, it's hard. Yeah, that's honest. It's real. I love, I love that question for that exact reason. I appreciate your vulnerability there. Um, yeah. I have one last question here for you, Stuart. Sure. I got to know, if you had a chance to whisper in the younger Stuart's ear, what would you say? Man, that's a great question. <clears throat> so it reminds me of, I'm going to tell you a story. It reminds me of a story that was done in the 1950s, early 60s by some students at Harvard. And they interviewed all the living, real rich, well, the, the, the Rockefellers, the Fords, Martin Luther King, all the, all the no, JFK, all the, the past presidents of, of what they would do, right? And, and, and the most common answer was they would start sooner, okay? But Dr. King and Mother Teresa, they had the same answer, and it wasn't start sooner. And so if, if you read the article... At the end, it tells you what their thoughts were, and their thoughts were to think bigger. And when you think of Dr. King and Mother Teresa and how many lives they touched throughout generations, they're both no longer with us, but I'm sure all your listeners know exactly who they are. You'd say to yourself, how could these people think bigger? I mean, they were pretty big. And so that's, that's right. what I would leave with our listeners today. Yes, start sooner, but at, at the end of the day, I'd like you to think bigger. Because the only limitations that you have are the limitations that you put on yourself. Back to the mindset, mind shift, shift concept. And so I, I would leave with that. And that is think bigger. How, how does, <clears throat> I'm going to take you, I'm going to, I love that. First off, thank you for that. How do we take that? And what would you say practically to the younger Stuart in order to get him to actually think bigger? What, what does that look like over the last 20, 30, 40 years? of Stuart, you know, from 20 all the way up, thinking bigger, what would you have done differently? I think my biggest fear was, was failure, that yeah. I didn't want to fail or lose money, miss an opportunity. And so I, I, I would whisper in my ear that I have the confidence, I have the wherewithal, and Go whatever it. mistake I made, we'll figure it out. That, yeah. that, that's the biggest challenge. And, and Tony Robbins talks about this in, in his six theories of, of needs. His, his first need is certainty. And then the second one is uncertainty. And so a lot of us as humans, we like certainty. We yeah. like knowing that you're going to stop at the red light when my light is green. We, we, right. we need certainty in our lives. It's yeah. our ability to handle the uncertainty of yeah. what the future holds. What if this doesn't work out? What happens if, right? That it, and that's... And, and, and that's a tough thing to, tough pill to swallow is yeah. being comfortable with uncertainty, but having the confidence in yourself and knowing that no matter what, I'm going to try, I, I'm going to figure it out. I'm not going to try yeah. to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. That's right. That's where the dilemma lies. Hey, I wasn't sure what would come of that follow-up answer, but man, it's straight gold. So I appreciate you digging into that a little bit. Let me press on you. How can the listener find you? Number one, if, if they're interested in real estate investing and they don't have anybody to teach them, you can teach them. How can they find you? Or if they're just interested in finding you and connecting with you as a business owner, how can they do that? Thank you so much for that opportunity to, to promote myself. So uh, the website, Contact Stewart. Contact Stewart is my website. I'm happy to go there. And, and I, uh, I think your listeners would be surprised because when the phone rings, I kind of answer my own phone. 
we're not this big giant conglomerate corporation where I'm so far removed that that's, yeah. that's not how I think successful entrepreneurs work. So if they want to reach out through the email, they want to reach out through a phone, 480-443-4500. That's my phone number, 480-443-4500. If I don't answer right away, it's probably because I'm on a podcast or helping somebody at that time. But other than that, I return all my phone calls and, and I make it my business to give everybody the time to listen, to see what I can do to help them. We call that in our office, we call it a 30-minute momentum session. I give everybody a 30-minute momentum session, whether for free, whether it's to just, just getting started or whether they're looking to scale. I, I work with Jay, the home buyer. He's been able to scale his wholesale business to over 40, 50,000 a month. But at the end of the day, with our 30 minute moment of session, it's not a sales pitch. Yeah. It's us getting to know each other, seeing what I can do to help you. And then here, here's what I found. A, a third of the people will take that information. Even, even when I do seminars and webinars, a third will take it and they'll go do something with it. And I may not hear from them for years. And that's happened. They come back and they thank me. And yeah. they're like, oh, I took this class. And then a third of the people will do nothing with it. Whether it's just not for them or they just get caught up in their own head, right? And then the other third, they're going to need some help and assistance. Yeah. And those are the ones that I'm here to help. Yeah, I love that. Knowing, knowing that there's purpose in, in what we do, even here today. I did hear you, obviously, before we got started here. You let your team know, hey, I'm going to be on a podcast. Hold the calls. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so I think that that's incredible. You would offer that type of intentional connection point, as we call it here with Gathering the King. Appreciate uh, your opportunity to to share with us your story, your your experience, the whole deal. We wish you nothing but blessing on the deals that you're going to do in 2023, 20, your your kids that you talked about earlier, thank your you team, too. everything. We just appreciate you being here. Thank you. And, and I feel like I've been blessed. And, and, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries and now interviewing literally over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings literally exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.